Uh, let me start off with two, I think, perhaps quick questions for you. One is, is the HG001 to 07 data publicly available? Yeah, that's a that's genome in a bottle data. Oh, oh, you mean uh, your data. data? Yeah, I think so, and it should be if it's not. Um, okay, but um, I will we'll, ask. Um, but that should be published, and and we should continue to publish every time we upgrade our our chemistry or base calling because things will things will be evolving fairly quickly. Okay. Remember the early days of selective right. sequencing, and, for example. Um, I, I know there are a couple of bioarchive papers. We'll try to find uh, if you have them handy and can drop them into the chat. That would be great. Okay. Um, Mark, uh, sorry, Mike, uh, one other question for you from Mike Smith. Have you thought about other applications for the spinning disk technology? Yes. Um, without, without giving away too much, it, it really lends itself to, to applications where you need a lot of area at low cost and, and also where you need to interact with the sample. And I, I think I'm going to leave it at that because we have some active, active work there that has not been published. Okay, um, Mark Akison, a uh, question for you, um, kind of picking up on one of the themes that Mark Pratt showed about the single molecule and cluster and transient mode of detection. So um, the nanopore is a transient mode of detection, which is you, you recognize a feature of the DNA as it's happening. Um, we had a question about how that, whether or not a nanopore device is like an electron microscope. And I think the mic, any kind of microscope is really more of a static image, but I wonder if you could sort of elaborate on that transient nature of the detection. Uh, I think it's fundamentally different than electron microscopy. And so I, I wouldn't want to, to confuse the two. Um, <clears throat> the transient nature uh, of the molecule. So a molecule is moving through the system <clears throat> and it's captured on the opposite side. And, and in typical nanopore space, it's not, cannot be resequenced. There are uh, efforts now underway uh, to basically resequence. And so to take the same strand and reverse order and move it back the other direction and sequence that as well and go, go on for um, a number of passes. So uh, the, the signal per se is transient because you've recorded the ionic current signature, but the molecule in principle, and it's not an easy task, we tried to do this for years, I think Oxford nanopores made more progress, is to be able to reread. So in that sense, you could go back and revisit that strand and uh, in, in principle, get better accuracy on one strand. So uh, I guess it's still transient because the ionic current signature is, is there uh, recorded, but the molecule is not necessarily lost to you. Um, currently, the, the devices use, use basically one pass, but I think that's probably not going to be the case always. Right. This, this pulls another question about uh, accuracy and coverage um, mm -hmm. that's, that's in the Q&A. And I, I think there's, um, you know, there, there are at least two to three different components to that. So one is a primary read accuracy, which is how often do you get it right? with an initial read of a single base from a single molecule. The second is consensus accuracy, which is if you add up enough independent observations, yes. how accurate is it? And the third is about <laughs> systematic bias. And I'm, yes. I'm wondering if you could, uh, if both uh, you, Mark Hickson and Mark Pratt could address the systematic bias. Let, let Mark go ahead first. I, was, I took the platform, but Mark, why don't you go ahead? Um, well, systematic, those are the things we, we fear the most in these systems and, and, uh, and want to hunt them down and, and find root causes. So we do have some systematic errors. So one of them uh, was driven by GC um, content and we've identified that as happening upstream of sequencing. And so we're trying to correct it there. Uh, we have other, because our, this is something I'm, um, I'm super worried about because of our, our machine learning we don't really know exactly what's happening in some of these, uh, identifying some of these systematic areas. So we have to manually uncover, um, in particular, the genomic contexts and, and how they drive systematic error. So I would say that's, that's one of the, uh, uh, the real challenges is to identify systematic errors and then find the root cause. But we know that we have some. And in particular, we also have, besides GC bias, we have um, systematic error around uh, low complexity readings. Uh, and I think right. this is again, 
an issue that, that, that may be more related to our amplification scheme than, than to the sequencing scheme. Uh, but the problem with this, we went through this over many years with selecting Illumina, is that like peeling an onion, you find the worst systematic to fix it for the next there are all tedious and, and, um, and, and you never know who's going to be responsible for the next one. So that's sort of the game that we're in and we're, we're fully committed. And I'd like to hear about, about, about nanopores as well. Yeah, so in answer to I, the, the person's question, a, a student, I imagine, but I don't know that. They may be one of the physicists that I was talking about. Um, we all, pretty much all platforms use uh, consensus accuracy to improve calls. So you, for example, in nanopore space, I was talking about 60x coverage of the human genome. So you make an alignment and uh, can improve the, the quality of the alignment by getting a consensus. And that's practiced in pretty much all uh, sequencing platforms. In nanopore space, the, the probably historically, the, the biggest problem of consistent error is in homopolymer stretches. And so you can imagine that uh, if you're reading along uh, a sequence of A's, for example, that uh, there, the signal for each one of those currently in nanopore uh, space cannot be distinguished one from the other. So if you just seen six of these A's pass through the device, or seven or eight or what have you. And the Oxford Nanopore solved that problem in part by making this two reading head platform. So up to 10 nucleotides, you can resolve uh, homopolymers reasonably accurately. The ideal in a, in a nanopore space one day would be to have a clock. So in other words, the enzyme or whatever uh, entity it is that's regulating movement of the DNA or RNA through the pore has a, a clock that is either uh, actuated to move at a few millisecond intervals uh, or a clock that reports on movement with a sort of tick. So you can tell that a base has moved uh, quantitatively. And I think those things are, are sort of still somewhat of a, of, of a dream, but I, I, can, I can see some bright physics undergraduate student ultimately coming up with a process to do that. I'd like to move on to a question for Sarah that uh, just popped up in the chat from Sanjay about um, direct nanopore sequencing of DNA and RNA and some of the variants might be associated to either unknown modifications or other DNA or RNA damage or other kinds of sort of things you didn't, didn't know you needed to look out for. Yeah, absolutely, especially for mRNA modifications. Um, we only know to look for what is known in the field already. And already in the last six months, we've had papers come out that have shown that dihydrouridine is a mod mRNA is modifi modified with dihydrouridine, which we didn't know before. Um, we thought that was a tRNA modification. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll, this is something that we definitely need to look out for. And it's something we need to consider with the controls that we use. <clears throat> And um, maybe Sarah, you could um, just address the question that was asked that you, you answered in the, in the, in the Q&A about where you get the synthetic RNA controls from. I think there's an interesting story there. Yeah, so the company I like for modified RNAs is GeneLink. I think they do a really nice job and their pricing is really good. Uh, so we order these as, so the question was about the 1000 mer sequences that we're making that have a single modification in the center. And that particular style of synthetic control is kind of, kind of challenging. Um, if you want to generate a long sequence that has multiple modifications in it, it's a little easier because you can replace the nucleotide when you're in vitro transcribing something, but to plant one in the center is a little bit harder. So we make the centerpiece. It's a 15 mer RNA that's synthesized on solid support with a single pseudouridine in the, in the center of it where we put it in. Um, and then we ligate it to two longer pieces that are in vitro transcribed from, from IDT gene blocks. Can I, can I just uh, chime in a little bit? That, that technique that uh, Sarah just talked about, I think you guys are doing that in collaboration with Jefferson University and that's a particularly powerful uh, innovation. 
And I think uh, for those people who are interested in nanopore sequencing of, of modifications uh, in RNA, it's going to be really important down the road. I want to add one other thing about uh, RNA space with modifications, and I think Sarah would agree, it's kind of the Wild West. And, and people uh, um, uh, venture into nanopore space and will use one base call or another to predict the existence or absence of modifications. And it's really important for the field and those of you who are, are joining the field to get validation in various ways, knockouts that knock out modifications at one position or another, synthetic strands like Sarah's talking about and mass spectrometry so that we can kind of uh, temper down this wild west of RNA modifications that are going on. I had a colleague, mass spec expert who was working with someone out of Jennifer Doudna's lab. So reputable RNA people and the software they were using predicted, you know, multiple modifications in one particular RNA strand. And when they did the mass spec, there were only two. <laughs> and so, so be, the, the field is gonna be really powerful down the road, um, but it's, you need to, everybody in the community has to be extraordinarily careful about claims about modifications, de novo, uh, new modifications they say they detected to make sure they're right. And as I think as the software increasingly depends on training data for the either deep learning or HMM based me methods, mm -hmm. you know, if you didn't train, you're only getting the, you're only getting answers to the questions that you're asking. And if you, so you have to be very careful about having a healthy skepticism about um, the interpretation, I think, uh, particularly, yeah. Can I ask a quick question here? Yeah. Uh, sure. How helpful has the full Adam MD been in terms of like perspective? Like, you know, I imagine that, you know, put this modification in, the current blockage will be this way, or has it uh, been after the fact? So, so far he, so Alec Aksumeni of who you may know uh, is particularly talented and their computers at the University of Illinois, originally they had so much power and this has probably been uh, superseded, but they had to build the power station next to their uh, computers uh, because they were drawing so much power. But uh, uh, answering your question early on, one of the questions is which way are strands of DNA going through the pore and can you resolve those? And he did an all atom simulation that predicted the orientation. And he later said, well, it was 50, 50 out of 50, 50 chance of getting it right. <laughs> so it turns out he was, but the, the, the key, and I think this is over the next 10 years is as the, the, the speed and cost of doing these simulations goes down, I think the all atom simulations will actually be the key to, to understanding a lot of, of and making predictions so that you don't have to run as many standards. And I think that's about 10 years out. And I think Aximenia would agree. Uh, I was always skeptical as many people are about uh, all atom simulations. Uh, and I get into arguments about with Aximenia and I'd say, well, you need to do an experiment. And he'd say, I have done an experiment. <laughs> it's all atom simulation that's, you know, has no, no particular outcome that I desire. It's a real outcome. And I think down the road, it, it's probably 10 years out, but going to be really useful. All right. Um, Mark, Mark um, one of the things that's been of interest in the, in the, in the nanopore area is the use of different pores for different applications. And uh, there have been a couple of papers this year talking about detection, characterization of peptides using nanopores as well. I wonder if you could say something about uh, the, where, where that stands now and what you feel like the potential for that is in, in other biological macromolecules. So was that addressed to me or? or yes, or, Mark, Mark. Yeah, Mark Higginson, thanks. Oh, okay. So, um, so for students, who are on this call. <clears throat> so there in, in, in DNA space, there's four ops at any, uh, options at any position. So uh, the complexity as you read longer and longer fragments uh, in KMERS in these windows is, is relatively manageable. With 20 options in an amino acid, uh, of amino acids in any position in a protein, it gets really complicated in a hurry. And so the question uh, down the road is, can you do 
de novo protein sequencing. And, and in nanopore space, it's important never to say it can't be done. This is a lesson people have learned the hard way over time, but it's going to be very, very challenging. I think what people are making progress on is fingerprinting of proteins. And there's some pretty cool stuff coming out pretty soon on being able to rifle denatured proteins through nanopores at high speed and being able to discriminate using machine learning again to, to fingerprint uh, at least a couple, differentiate between a couple of proteins. So I think fingerprinting, yes. Sequencing uh, with nanopores of proteins, I think uh, is not impossible, but it's probably a ways off. Um, many thanks. I think uh, we'll close this first session at this point. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, first of all, thank Mark and Mark and Sarah for their talks. Really interesting, illuminating, lots to think about.